um, one of the things I think I need to say is that I told the City Council we need to look at the paid fire department. It's $419,000 and are we getting $419,000 worth of services out of that fire department? Now the City Council also has to look at the police department. It has a large budget. Are we getting the services we need out of the police department? The fact of the matter is, is the city's general fund, which is what we get from property taxes and sales taxes, is stretched to its very limit. You can drive around the town and you can see the potholes, the streets, the drainage, and we don't have the funds to put into those. And, that, and those are also funded out of the general fund. So the city council is going to have to make some hard priority choices. It's not like we have a large recreation budget. It's not like we have non-essential services that we're funding out of the general fund. Everything we fund is essentially an essential service. So we're going to have to look at getting the most bang for the buck and the most usage out of those funds that we have available because nobody wants to raise taxes. It's a, this is a small town. Um, it's not a wealthy town. Most people in town aren't, you know, can't just absorb a tax increase and say, oh, well, that's fine. Um, so the city council is going to have to look at everything. The fire department was the first department I brought up saying, Our, you know, let's do a cost-benefit analysis. Let's see if we're getting $419,000 worth of services. Now, I know that if it's your mother that's out there and she's having a heart attack and one of our EMTs show, uh, get there before the ambulance does and they save her life, to you it's worth $419,000. The question is, is are we getting that service? Because as a fire department with only two people on per shift, they can't go into a building under, uh, under a fire. Because under fire rules, it's two in, two out. You have to have, in order to put anybody into a building, you have to have two people outside. So we can't fight a fire from inside of a building until mutual aid shows up from some other department because we only have two people to, per duty. Yes, they're EMTs, and that's why I said we really don't have a paid fire department. We have a paid EMT service. They can prepare fire equipment. They can fight a fire from outside of a building. But as far as actual fire department, with only two people per shift, we have a very limited firefighting capability. They are EMTs. They often do get there before an ambulance. They do provide a valuable service. But are we getting the, the bang for the buck? I'm not advocating closing anything. I didn't come here to lay people off. We're being... Um, directed by TCEQ to increase staffing at the water plant. Now that's out of the water fund, but if we have to spend more money on the water fund for staffing, it means any monies they have transferred from the water fund to the general fund to help balance the general fund is going to go away. So we've got serious budget choices we're going to have to make in this community. and. We need to start the dialogue now and not wait till July when we start talking about the budget that has to be passed before October 1st. We need to start talking about it now. We need to have these community discussions now so when we get ready to do a budget in July that'll go into effect on October 1st while making informed decisions and the public has had the opportunity for real input and not just the very, very truncated um, input that people get through a, quote, normal budget process. We need to have these discussions now. From a budget standpoint, if we do cut the, uh, the fire department and we save that 400 plus thousand mm -hmm. per year, uh, where would that 400,000 be allocated in the budget? Well, I would, I would assume that some of it would have to go to whoever we're contracting for fire services. If we contract with the um, Marlin Volunteer Fire Department, they're going to want some money, some of that money, to actually perform the services within the city. And we'll probably put some um, 
strings on that money, saying we want certain particular type of services for them to have available. That's, again, that's the way it's worked in other communities that I've seen do this. Um, hopefully, we'd have a couple of hundred thousand left, or at least a hundred thousand left, that we can start making a dent on our streets and drainage issue. The number of phone calls I get, people so frustrated with potholes and everything else, and we've got such a limited budget that it's all we're doing is patching the worst of the worst. We don't have the funds to go in and start rebuilding streets to start actually a really strong infrastructure program. One of the things that I'm going to suggest to the City Council is in, in all of this discussion is do we want to look at putting a bond issue before the voters? If the voters are really frustrated enough with the streets and drainage, would they be willing to pass like a $5 million bond that we would go in and, get a head, and, and really get a head start on some of this um, infrastructure issue? Now, if you pass a bond issue, you either need to raise taxes to pay for that bond, or you've got to find that revenue. Now, some of that revenue saved, if we cut back the fire department, if we cut back the police department, if we cut someplace else where I don't know where, but if we, we found some money, that could go into those bond repayments. Is there any type of grants or funding out there that's available for infrastructure such as for our streets. There's, there's almost no grant programs out there. I know there, uh, there have been discussions about what did the, the city of Mark got $22 million. 17 and a half of that is a loan that in three years they're going to be paying back at $900,000 a year for a city right now of a $1.3 million budget. Now, I don't know how they're planning to pay that loan back, I don't know what their plan is, but right now that loan repayment is more than half of their budget. Now, maybe they've got some taxes coming online, maybe something to do with that power plant or something that they, they think that they can handle that loan. But that was not a grant. In spite of what some people in the community say, that wasn't free money. That's money that's gonna have to be paid back. And there's very little streets and drainage grant funds out there. I'm trying to get some flood mitigation money that we might be able to use for some drainage issues. But um, that is not an area uh, because where, where the grants are is health and safety, clean water, cl you know, treating sewer. That is where the grant money is from the federal government and even from the state government. Streets, you know, well-paved streets are not considered health and safety. And although it's driving some of these streets, especially my little car, I could lose it. <laughs> and and I understand, and I certainly understand people's frustration. I, you know, uh, it's 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 a situation that it has deteriorated so far. As as I've told the council, just to kickstart some of this we've got to have more money than we currently have in the budget because right now we're just scrambling to keep caught up and and we're not we're still falling behind so i've got to somehow find a pool of money that i can actually start rebuilding things as opposed to patching things right. and from a citizen standpoint the question is being we've always heard that the budget is tight the city doesn't have any money from a pro professional standpoint how do how is it that we get in a predicament like this? Because this is not a, a predicament that we landed in overnight. And I know that you can't go back and dwell on the past too much. You have to, to move forward. But something had to land us here in a position that we're in as far as strained budget, you know, torn up streets, dilapidated houses. Um, you know, it just seems from a citizen standpoint, it seems to be uh, neglect, uh, mismanagement of funds, and then when you hear that the city has gotten uh, grant funds for this project and mm -hmm. that project, and you go, well, why we can't get a, a grant to fix our streets or right. some of the essential things 
that we need to uh, stimulate growth for, for the community. Right. Um, again, the grant funds and even loan programs out there are, are limited for streets and drainage. Um, if you would allow me to do just a little bit of casting judgment upon the city. I don't really mean this as a criticism, but one of the things that I get from some long-term residents, they like to talk about how prosperous Mar uh, Marlin used to be. And I know from looking back at, at relatively recent budgets within 10 years, you used to have a much bigger uh, staff than you currently do here in Marlin. And frankly, I think Marlin had in its own mind, it was a bigger, more prosperous community for longer than it was a bigger and prosperous community. That people didn't realize that they were losing population, that they were losing tax base, and they tried to provide all the services, and they fell further and further behind, and they used up more and more reserves, until all of a sudden, you wake up one day and you don't have a lot of money in reserves and you can't afford to be the big town that you thought you were because you're not that town. Miss Skaggs, the other day at the meeting, was talking about the number of department stores you used to have, three thriving grocery stores. That's not here now. That tax base isn't here now. That sales tax base isn't here now. And I think the city lived beyond its means too long and didn't really realize, didn't really do it strong enough self-evaluation to say, um, we've got to change your mindset. And it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's, it's, I know you're a lifelong resident. It's hard for you to actually look around and say, wow, this used to be a very prosperous storefront. It's closed now. That means probably the tax base on the building's gone down. That means the city's getting no sales tax base. It's, it's, it's hard to internalize that when things used to be so well. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that you need to look around and you need to say, you're a poor rural community. You are not a prosperous little town. And it, I don't think a lot of people um, realized that soon enough and you dug yourself a little bit of a hole that we now have to find a way to get out of. And the most important way to get out of it is I've got to find and I've got to work with business owners and I've got to work with out, uh, both our current business owners and bring people in for economic development. The hot spring should be something that the city should be marketing. It is something that, um, now the old bathhouses, of course, th those were all developed around illness. And that's the reason why uh, almost every town that had a hot spring that was fairly well known, th they almost all went out of business because everybody associated the hospitals and the areas around the hot springs as something to do with polio or some other illness. Now, what has happened in some areas with hot springs is now they've developed more um, recreational spas around them. Now, we're, we're not that far from incredible population sources with people with money who may want a natural hot, who may, may want to bathe in waters of a natural hot spring. City should be trying to market that and to bring a developer in here, and it's one of the things that I'm I'm trying to do is reach out to developers I've known in some of my other jobs and, um, and, 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 and reach out and find out if we could, if we could get a spa. And even if, it had, even if it was a business that still focused on healing waters, we can advertise ourselves we're less than a half hour from major medical centers. So we could be a, a healing waters community again we could be a luxury spa community and people say, oh, well, Marlin is never going to be luxury anything. Well, you know what? A developer can come in here and build and it can be a luxury spa even if the rest of the community isn't at that level. And then 
we start creating a tax base. We start creating places where people can work again. And once we get people back to work, they can start fixing up their houses a little bit more than what they have been. Because I don't begrudge anybody who says, I can't afford to paint my house because I don't have a job. There, we, we've, got to, we've got to start that development and we've got to stop the mindset that if you make a dollar and I'm not making a dollar, then I'm, I'm mad at you. We've got to get to the mindset that I'm happy that you're making a dollar. And what can I do to make a dollar off the dollar you're making? And start having that money flow through the community because then we can see an increase in a tax base. Then the general fund starts getting healthier. That's what we need to do. Am I the right man for the job? I don't know. The city council hired me. I've got a lot of experience. This is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And uh, we've had two terrible tragedies between Chief Allen and the water. And I, I've never been in a situation in all of my career, eight weeks on a boil water notice. I can't imagine. I mean, I lived through it. I live, I live in town. I knew what it was like as far as trying to cook and everything else and trying to keep myself healthy. Um, I can't imagine um, eight weeks of that. We're not going to let that happen again. And, and TCQ isn't going to allow us to get into that position. I mean, we had a meeting and they actually used the word receivership. If we don't do what we need to do, they'll take that water plant from us and they'll run it and they'll tell us what the water rates are going to be. We don't want that to happen. We don't want the state to take the school system and run the school system, and we don't want the state to take the water plant and run the water plant. We want to keep local control, but we're gonna to have to be responsible to do it. Right. And, and that is a, and, and that means everybody has got to start working together. And, they, and, and people have gotta hold a mirror up to themselves and say, what am I doing to be positive rather than reliving past grievances. The community, city council made the decision to go to the electronic water meters. It means we replaced all the old water meters with new water meters. Now, this was an old water system. A lot of those water meters that had been in the ground had probably been in the ground for a very long time. The older a water meter get, especially if you have hard water, the slower they turn so they don't read accurately. You go pull the old water meter, put a new one in that's actually reading accurately, and all of a sudden people were, uh, were getting billed for the real amount of water they were using as opposed to what the old water meter showed. We haven't changed rates. What's happened is we changed meters and therefore, and it's I, every place I've been that we've done a large water meter swap, people start getting higher water bills because they're getting because their the meters are running uh, more, are reading more accurately, and people didn't realize how much water they were using. Yeah. Now and 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 we have found meter uh, some of the new meters were reading wrong, and we've swapped them out. We fixed them. We've made made some adjustments. But um, the fact of the matter is, is that um, I don't, I, I think, and, I, and it's, I'm going to get myself into trouble for saying this, is that, you know, people were, were not getting billed for the water they were used. They were getting a free ride for a long time, and now all of a sudden you're getting billed for the water that's actually being used. The, the new water meters were essentially put in in September and October. That's when we swapped out all from the old ones to the new yeah, electronic meter. Yeah. Well, you may have had a you may have had a new meter, but not you know this. We we swapped out for the electronic water meters so that we can uh, we don't have to go out and manually read meters. And and I know that's one of the things that frustrates people. I had somebody in saying you're not reading my meter because I put a rock on my meter cap and and it hasn't moved. And it's like well we don't need to open the box anymore to read the meter. We can do it electronically. And um, but. Um, 
I, I don't know why for some individuals we haven't changed rates. So the question is, is that the meters are showing more water going through the meter. Um, and, and I do think that we have found people that now that we have the electronic ones in and we can actually go, we can actually go to that meter, type, do a couple commands into the uh, computer and tell that meter to give, uh, uh, to give us your la its last 30 days of what it's done by per hour. And we found leaks. We found, I found when you can find that probably you had a toilet running that you know you normally have to jiggle your handle. Um, it's, it's close enough that because it, it, uh, we can actually get a reading by the hour, I can tell you if you're the gentleman that gets up in the middle of the night and flushes the toilet. And I can actually, we can actually see that on a meter. Now, uh, if, uh, it's, if we don't automatically get it, we have to go ask the meter for the, uh, for the information if we've received a complaint about somebody that's getting a lot of water use. Um, I, uh, I had a person come in who was complaining about their, their water bill went, went, went way up. Um, their usage went up that we could tell from their past. And I went in and I could, we downloaded the data from the meter and I said, okay, uh, this, during these two weeks, you had a lot more water usage. And it was like, oh, well, that's when my grandchildren were visiting. And I said, okay, that's where your water usage went up this month. We, we can look at, we, we can find that information. Um, I don't know, again, I, I, individually, I, I don't know why, uh, why yours would have um, just recently spiked, um, but we can certainly go back and look at our history and try to figure out what it was reading at and what it's reading at now. Before, before this water crisis happened in, in November, one of the things that we were um, testing for is we, the water plant, we, we, we did not bill nearly as much as the water plant produced water. So the question was, is what was happening to that water? Now, because of the crisis, we haven't gone through and done a, a most recent analysis because of the boil water, you know, are we getting accurate? But what we, what we are going to do now that we're operating the plant and um, properly is we're going to start matching up with what we're billing versus the water we're producing to see if it matches. Now, if I find I'm billing for more water than I'm producing, then I've got a problem with water meters. If I'm finding we're now billing for the amount of water we're actually producing, then I can say, okay, we're, we're now reading things properly. But because of two months worth of crisis, we haven't been able to do that analysis. But that analysis is going to be done. It's, it is something we're gonna be looking at. And again, I don't, you know, we, that's a possible outcome, but we, we haven't done that analysis yet. My, my intent in talking to the city council and starting that discussion on their uh, priorities and my observations of my first three months here was to start the discussion. Not to say this is the final decision. I don't make final decisions. City council makes final decisions. I make recommendations. I said, we've got to look at it as a cost-benefit analysis. Then we have to look, even if we decide, okay, it's a lot of money, then we're going to have to look at what our alternatives are. And can a volunteer fire department provide the services necessary? That's another whole set of analysis we've, we have to do. But we have to start having a discussion, because if we don't have the discussion, at some point in time, um, I'm sure you watch the news. We don't want to be Flint, Michigan. We don't want the state to come in and take over the town and say, okay, I don't live here. I'm not elected. I don't care. I'm going to run the town the most efficient way possible and have, you know, something devastating happen. We want to keep, 
we want to keep the local control. I know, I mean, but if we don't have the discussion, what happens if you don't make a bond payment and you default and you go into bankruptcy? I don't want to scare anybody, but this town is not that far away from having those discussions. You don't have a whole pool of money sitting in reserves. You have over $19 million of debt from that water plant, the sewer plant, from other bonds you've taken out in the past. Um, you, don't, you don't want to find out what happens if we go into receivership. So we have to have those discussions. We have to have them as mature adults. And we have to realize that somebody's ox is going to get gored. Somebody's sacred cow is going to get butchered. And it's... And if we work together, everybody will, quote, share the pain. And hopefully everybody will, as things get better, share in the benefit. Right. And, and, but we have to start having a mature adult discussion. And we can't just knee-jerk say, no, I support the fire department, cut someplace else. Okay, I'm going to cut the police department. Well, crime goes up. Okay, add police officers. Where am I going to cut? Uh, you know, now. Um, at some point in time, everything is going to affect everything. Right. If I had a big pot of money that I didn't have to cut anything and I could just spend, that'd be wonderful. We're not in that circumstance. Right. So we're going to have to make hard choices and we're going to have to make reasoned choices and we're going to have to treat each other with respect as we have the conversations. I am not the final decision maker. I am the city manager. The city council sets policy. Their number one policy document that a city council issues is its budget. Where do we want to spend our money? And we've got to spend the money wisely. And, they, and they, the discussion has to start. I understand how strongly people feel. The discussion has to start. You're not having a benefactor coming in here and slapping $35, 40000000 million down on the table saying, let's, uh, let's fix the problems of the city. We're going to have to fix the problems of the city one street at a time, one firefighter at a time, one police officer at a time. And we've got to, we've got to look at the services that a city this size with its tax base can afford. An awful lot of community. The auditor has been telling this city council for the last five years that cities of this size tend not to have paid fire departments because they tend not to be able to afford them. The fiscal decisions of past city councils, the fiscal decisions of let's take a little bit of money out of reserve because we don't want to raise taxes, have come home to roost. You're going to have to make hard choices. You're going to have to make reasoned choices. You're going to have to decide what kind of city you want to be. You're going to decide, decide what kind of services that we can provide. I didn't take the job to fire anybody. I didn't take the job to lay anybody off. I didn't take the job to cut services. I didn't take the job to increase services. I came in to manage the city in the best way possible with the resources available. And the policies are going to be set by the city council. And we have to start the discussion now because if we wait much longer, it might be too late. Cost-benefit analysis is going to have to be done on all of the city services. And like I said, if we had a, you know, and, 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 and I'd have I'd have parents with torches and pitchforks. Let's say, let's say I had an expensive um, recreation department right now, and I was talking about okay, we're going to slash the rec budget because 
well, we don't have money. Then I'm going to have parents in here saying you, you can't slash the rec budget. If we had a city pool that I was spending $25,000 a year on to keep a city pool going, and I said we can't afford $25,000 a year to keep a city pool going, I'm going to have you know torches and pitchforks in here. Um, at some point in time, though, this city, uh, the level of services we're providing are basically down at the, at the bare bone level. So now the question is going to be, is if we still don't have the money, then what are our hard choices? Police, fire, these, those, you know, and roads and streets. And right now we've been neglecting roads and streets already. Um, at some point in time, what can you afford to be? I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, at some point in time, somebody might very well say, can, can Marlin support, uh, can, can afford to be a city or do we want to disincorporate and just become part of the county? Don't know if it'll ever get to that point. Reverend Slugger, we have to start the discussion and we have to talk like reasonable adults. Right. And I'm not making any final decisions. I'm hired help. I was brought in because I have 20 years experience as a city manager and the city council thought that my, my skill set was something that was going to help them make those decisions. And um, I know my personality, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I, I can be a little bit abrasive. I have a sarcastic sense of humor. But the fact of the matter is, is I'm good at what I do and I'm going to give them the honest truth and give them the facts so they can make the decisions.